We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 5 this morning. So if you have your Bible, let me encourage you to find Nehemiah chapter 5. It's a little bit hard to find. It's in the Old Testament. If you can find First and Second Kings and then First and Second Chronicles, then you come to Nehemiah. And we are in week four of our fall series called Letters to the Next President. And, and I'm saying week four because I'm including what Drew Ray shared with you last week in my absence. And even though Drew didn't teach specifically on our topic, which is the intersection of politics and faith, I think he did a really nice job of reminding us that the biggest opportunity for change in our nation is not going to come from the White House. It's not going to come from the government. It's going to come from the local church. That there are spiritual adjustments that we need to make before we can expect to see adjustments made in our culture. Now, obviously, faith and politics can be a pretty touchy subject. And if you've not been here uh, during the past three weeks, you may be surprised I'm even bringing this topic up. But what we've said is that there are some really good examples in God's Word of godly men giving godly advice to ungodly national leaders. And so what we're doing each week is we're attempting to take that advice and apply it in our present day context so that we can understand what God expects from a political leader and that helps us know what kind of political leaders we need to be electing and it helps us understand what our responsibilities are as a dual citizen of the kingdom of God on one side and of the United States of America on the other side. And, and then to sort of bring everything together each week, we're composing a letter to our next president, whoever that may be. And we're using that letter to, to sort of summarize everything that we've learned. And I've even invited you to contribute to these letters by emailing me at justinfordoakdale at gmail.com. Gmail and, I, and I thank those of you who have been doing that over these past weeks. And then I've also had people asking if there's a way to get a copy of these letters uh, that we're sharing. And, and so we've been posting those on our website at oakdalebc.com. And you can also see any of the messages that you've missed along with those letters. Now, two weeks ago, we learned the story of Daniel and his advice to the Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar. And from this story, we pulled out two what we're calling wise leadership principles that we're actually going to add to today. Now, those first two principles were these. Number one, a wise leader surrounds himself or herself with godly advisors even if he doesn't subscribe to their faith. Number two, a wise leader surrounds himself with people who will give him the truth, not platitudes. In other words, not just what he or she wants to hear. Now, today, as I said, we're going to add to those wise leadership principles to the story of a man named Nehemiah and his incredible example of leadership in a very, very difficult and complicated political environment. But before we get to Nehemiah, I want to talk about a principle that will help us understand why Nehemiah was able to accomplish what he accomplished. So let me start with this. Every single person in this room has experienced what it means to be under the authority of someone, right? Just nod your head, yes, if, if you've ever been under someone's authority, yes. I mean, we're under someone's authority right now, right? Whether it's a parent, whether it's a teacher, or a boss, or a police officer, we are under someone's authority in different areas of our life. Now, some people who are in authority over us have earned our respect, and so we are compelled to do what they tell us to do. And some people who are in authority over us have not earned our respect, but for the most part, we are still compelled to do what they tell us to do, correct? I mean, that's how authority kind of works. Now, I'm going to call this kind of authority designated authority, Designated authority, that's the kind of authority that is put into place over you and, and you pretty much have to submit to it, but you don't have to like it. Are you with me here? And, and would you agree with me that, that most of the time when you have designated authority in your life that you don't respect, even if you have to submit to it, the reason you don't respect it is that there is a lack of alignment between what that person says and what that person does. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know that you do. Maybe you have a boss and you know that when they're with the customers or maybe with their own supervisors, they're one way. 
But when the door is closed and there's nobody to impress or to give accountability, they are a completely different person. They do things that maybe you don't agree with or they say things that you're not very comfortable with, but they are still your boss, right? And so unless you want to go find another job, you will continue to submit to their authority even if you don't like it. Why? Because they have designated authority over you. And quite honestly, there is a lot of designated authority in our life, isn't there? But there is another kind of authority that is very, very different. And I'm going to call that moral authority. And understand something before we go any further. I am not talking about some kind of self-designated, self-righteous authority, moral authority, okay? Because I, I think we can kind of take it that way. That's not what I'm talking about at all. Here is our definition we're going to work with. I, I include, ask you to fill in a blank here and kind of write this in. Moral authority is the alignment between what a person says and does that gives them influence they otherwise wouldn't have. Does that make sense? Let me read it again. The alignment between what a person says and does that gives them influence they otherwise wouldn't have. Now, I'm guessing that there are people in your life who have moral authority in your mind. They already have authority over you because it's been designated, but in this case, they also have an influence over you. Because of the fact that, more often than not, what they say and what they do line up with one another. Would you agree with me? Do you have that somewhere in your life? I, I bet that you do. Now, interestingly, there are two positions of authority in our culture that are expected to operate with moral authority, but are really struggling to do so in people's eyes. One is preachers. You say, oh, come on. Preachers? Really? Preachers don't have any authority. Give me a break. <laughs> well, they did, okay, a long time ago, at one time. For a long time, preachers had authority. Uh, let's see if you can fill in the blank on this statement. You've got to practice what you preach. Uh -huh. you, 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 what does that mean? It means, yeah, you've got some designated authority you know, as a pastor, but, but when what you say and what you do don't line up, there's no way that you're going to have any kind of moral authority over me. And would you agree a pastor needs some moral authority in order to be effective with the people to which he ministers? So religion is one area where we absolutely expect moral authority. The other is, believe it or not, anybody want to guess? Politics. Politics. I know that almost kind of sounds funny, doesn't it? But think about it. It's true. Here's the bottom line. We want to elect people who have alignment between what they say and what they do. We resist political leaders who say one thing and do another. Which is why so many of you are so cynical about this election cycle, isn't it? Because depending on who wins the presidency, you know what, or maybe regardless of who wins, they're going to have a hard time achieving any kind of moral authority in your mind. And so here is wise leadership principle number three. A wise leader understands designated authority, but leads with moral authority. Okay? They understand designated authority, but they lead with moral authority. And listen, it's not like we're expecting to elect George Washington, who couldn't tell a lie. Okay? We're not looking for Honest Abe to be on the ticket this year. That, that's not our standard. All we want, all we want, Washington is to elect someone who says what they believe and then does what they say. It ought to be so simple. Well, this morning, in the story of Nehemiah, we're going to find a guy, again, in a very, very tough political environment who worked very hard to make sure there was alignment between what he said and what he did. Here's the background. If, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the story of Daniel and how after years of disobedience to God, the nation of Israel was finally allowed by God to be overthrown by the Babylonians. Now, not only did the Babylonians defeat Israel, they destroyed the Israelite cities. They tore down their city walls that protected them. They tore down the temple of God that Solomon built. 
And they hauled off all of the best and the brightest, like Daniel, back to Babylon, these Israelites, where they served at the pleasure of the king for, for years and years and years and years. Now some of the Israelites, like Daniel, were able to rise in prominence and become political and spiritual advisors to the king. Well, years passed. Israel is still in exile, and eventually the Babylonians gave way to the Persians, and a new king, kind of the same people, but with a, a different slant, and a new king, and his name was Artaxerxes, who history tells us looked like this. But, if you've ever seen the movie 300, you know he actually looked like this. Right? I mean, everybody knows that. Now, just as if you're, and if you're looking at that picture going, what in the world? Well, you just, you got to see 300, okay? As an aside, would that not be the coolest name you could ever give your kid? Artaxerxes, right? Would that not be awesome? Uh, what's your name, little boy? Art. Oh, really? Is that short for Arthur? No, Artaxerxes, right? I mean, that's just a cool... Anyway, just like the former Babylonian king had, trusted, had a trusted advisor in the Israelite Daniel Artaxerxes, this real person who lived in history, he eventually developed trust in an Israelite advisor named Nehemiah. Nehemiah not only gained the king's trust, he also apparently gained the king's ear. Because there comes a point in the story where he goes to King Artaxerxes and he says, I'm hearing reports from back home in Jerusalem that there are Israelites trying to put our nation back together, but they're having a really hard time. Their economy is in shambles. Their city is a mess. And what they really need in order to kind of get back on track is to be able to rebuild the defensive wall around Jerusalem. Basically, in that ancient time, if you didn't have a wall, you didn't have a city, okay? So they've got to be able to rebuild the wall. And it's a little bit, the story's a little bit more complicated than this, but basically Nehemiah asks Artaxerxes, would you let me travel back to Jerusalem to start trying to rebuild the wall? Well, incredibly, Artaxerxes says, I'll do you one better than than that. I'll not only let you go, I'll send you with resources, massive resources. And I'll give you a letter declaring that you're now the new governor of Jerusalem with direct orders from me to rebuild that wall and restart that nation. Now, you have to ask the question, why in the world would a pagan Persian king do something like this for Israel? Well, part of the answer is because the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and He gives them to anyone He wishes. Amen? we got to remember that. And part of the answer has to do actually with the kind of person that Nehemiah was. Okay? So Nehemiah packs up his, you know, his letter proclaiming him governor. Uh, he packs up a big pile of money that Artaxerxes gives him to kind of get the economy started. And, and he packs up all the resources that would be needed to build this two and a half mile long 40 foot wall around Jerusalem. But when Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem, he discovers there is a huge, huge problem. Apparently, there had been a drought in the land, which had resulted in a terrible economic depression. And we learn about the consequences of this in Nehemiah. This is chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Let me read to you. It says, About this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, We have such large families. We need more food to survive. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields, vineyards, our homes to get food during the famine. And others said, we had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy. And our children are just like theirs. And yet we must sell our children into slavery. Think about it. Just to get enough money to live. We have already sold some of our daughters. And we are helpless to do anything about it, for our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. Now, let me kind of explain what's going on here. When Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, he realized that the people were under an enormous economic burden because of this drought. And what they had done was to borrow money from some of the neighboring nations using their land as collateral. That's big, big time no-no, according to God's word, by the way. But they did it because they were desperate. But when they couldn't make their payments, they lost their land. 
And so many of them had been forced to sell themselves and their family members into slavery in order to pay their debts. Well, when Nehemiah shows up, one of the first things he does is to take some of the enormous wealth of the Persian Empire that had been sent with him, and he actually used it to buy back the people, and he bought back the land from their creditors. I mean, think about this. The Israelites are in the worst position you can be in. Very little hope in this situation. But then they hear that a new governor has been appointed to come into Jerusalem, get the nation organized, get its defenses organized, and its economy under control. And then wonder of wonders, that politician actually does exactly what he said he was going to do. Which includes using the resources at his disposal to help you recover from a national and natural disaster as opposed to lining his own pockets. And here's where we get our wise leadership principle number four. A wise leader identifies the greatest needs of his people, makes a commitment to meet those needs, and then follows through on what he has promised. Do you see it? And that is exactly what Nehemiah had done. But now he finds out, now he finds out, this wasn't just foreign creditors who were causing this problem. It was actually Israelite creditors. And that was a big, big deal because part of God's law for nearly a thousand years had been that you, yes, you can loan money to your fellow Israelites in order to help them in a time of need to ensure that they don't ever lose their land, but you do not charge them interest ever, okay? That was the rule. No interest. And yet these wealthy Israelites were apparently taking advantage of the terrible economic situation for personal gain. And in verse 6, we find Nehemiah's response to this. Listen to what he says when he finds out what they had been doing to one another. He says, When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. And after thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials. And I told them, You are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then we find out that Nehemiah was actually the first Baptist in the Bible. How do we know this? Verse 7, Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. <laughs> right? At the meeting I said to them, We are doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners. But you are selling them back into slavery again. I love this. How often must we redeem them? You, you, you hear about in our government sometimes spending money multiple times, buying the same bridge over and over and over and over. He says, how many times do I have to buy these people back? And you just keep doing the same thing. And then Nehemiah gets the response that honestly tells you everything you need to know about the situation at hand, about the character of, of these powerful Israelites and the character of Nehemiah himself. This is the last part of verse 8. And they had nothing to say in their defense. Would you agree with me? That's a pretty significant statement. And they had nothing to say in their defense. He goes on in verse 9. Then I pressed further. What you are doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God in order to avoid being not mocked by enemy nations? I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain. But now, let us stop this business of charging interest. You must, listen to this, you must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to them this very day and repay them the interest you charged when you lent them money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. Now understand what he's challenging them to do. He's saying, not only do I want you to end the biggest money-making scheme you've ever employed, I want you to give back what you have unlawfully taken. That means that, that shiny new plow that you got by giving your neighbor a loan, you knew they could never repay, you've got to give that back. That, that new chariot you bought your wife for her anniversary, that's got to go back to the dealership, okay? It can't stay. You have to stop what you're doing and you've got to give back what does not belong to you. Here's verse 12. They replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. And that's how you know this is just a Bible story. <laughs> right? 
Because nobody would really do that, would they? That's not going to happen in real life. Well, guess what? If you're a little skeptical like I am, guess what? Nehemiah agreed with you. He didn't believe him for a second. Listen to verse 12. Then he called in the big guns. Then I called the priests and I made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised to do. Hand on the Bible, right? In other words, yeah, I don't believe you. Not for one second. And it's one thing for you to make me a promise, but it's something completely different for you to make God a promise. Verse 13, he says, I shook out the folds of my robe and I said, if you fail to keep this promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and from your property. In other words, words matter, but actions matter even more. Amen? Words matter, but actions matter more. And if you go back on the promise you've made to God, there will be consequences. Verse 13, and the whole assembly responded, Amen, which means we agree. And they praised the Lord, and, this is the most important part, and the people did as they promised. Now, I think you'd agree with me. As incredible as that story is, it's pretty hard to believe. Especially if we look at it through, through the lens of our current political environment. Because I think as a nation, we're to a point where we almost expect our political leaders not to keep their promises, don't we? I mean, that's kind of where we are. But you know what? Honestly, and I have to remind myself of this, people are the same as they've always been. So how is it that Nehemiah was able to get these political leaders to not only make a promise, but to keep a promise to the people and to their God? Well, Nehemiah actually ends this part of the story by giving us some insight into how he was able to impact the situation to the degree that he did. Okay, this is verse 14. I'm going to read you verses 14 through 19. Listen. For the entire 12 years that I was governor of Judah. So this is before any of this stuff happened. From the 20th year to the 32nd year of the reign of King Artaxerxes, neither I nor my officials drew on our official food allowance. The former governors, in contrast, had laid heavy burdens on the people, demanding a daily ration of food and wine besides 40 pieces of silver. Even their assistants took advantage of the people. Because, but because I feared God, I did not act that way. That should be on a bumper sticker. In fact, that would be a great political slogan, would it not? I fear God, therefore I will not act like everyone else. Verse 16, I also devoted myself to working on the wall, and I refused to, require, to acquire any land, and I required all my servants to spend time working on the wall. I asked for nothing, even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table, besides all the visitors from other lands. Verse 18, the provisions I paid for each day included one ox, six choice sheep or goats, and a large number of poultry. And every ten days we needed a large supply of all kinds of wine. Yet I refused to claim the governor's food allowance because the people already carried a heavy burden. And then he finishes by saying to God, Remember, O oh God, O oh my God, all that I've done for these people and bless me for, for it. Listen, here's what was expected. You get appointed as governor of a region like Judea. You come in and you just raise taxes on the people. Okay, that's what you do. A percentage of the taxes goes back to Persia, but another percentage of the taxes come to you. So as governor, what is it to your advantage to do? Raise those taxes, man. Raise them high, all right? Squeeze those people as much as you possibly can because the, the higher the taxes they pay, the more income you get. And you do not worry about the impact those taxes will have on the people. You worry about how much money you can make. That's what you do. Well, this is exactly what the former governors had done. But Nehemiah does the opposite. He says for 12 years, listen, if you're, if you're falling asleep right now, right now, slap yourself in the face. I'm telling you, this is important, okay? For 12 years, he says, I refuse to collect the official food allowance or the food tax. He says, I wouldn't do it. I had plenty. The people around me were suffering. I was not going to take from them what they desperately needed for themselves. And I wasn't going to allow my administration to do it either. 
see that? Not only that, he says, when it came time to pay for the expensive dinners to host the, the leaders of Israel and the dignitaries from other nations, I used my own money to pay for that. Because I didn't think it was right to take food from starving people in order to feed people who already had more than enough. Here's wise leadership principle number five. A wise leader earns credibility through personal sacrifice. Through personal sacrifice. Now, let me give you an illustration of what this would look like in our day. This would be similar to a president spending eight years in office and at the end of you know, his second term, after he's been reelected and everything, at the very end, the press asks him one day, Mr. President or Mrs. President, we know that you are a big-time golfer, right? I mean, you can't even be president unless you can play golf, right? Uh, we know you're a big golfer throughout your life, throughout your career. You have always loved to play golf. But we have noticed over the past eight years, you haven't golfed a single time. Can you explain that to us? And then the president would say, well... You know, I really wasn't going to say anything about this, but I made a decision eight years ago that as long as our national debt is $19 trillion, I wasn't going to be spending the taxpayers' money on golf. That's not a big deal. I didn't announce it. It's just something I was personally convicted about. And I decided to do it. Do you see the parallel? How many of you would fall over dead of a heart attack if one of our presidents actually did something like that? Because let me tell you something, and, and listen, if you're a politician sitting here, no, I'm not going to apologize. I was, I was about to apologize, but I'm not going to. Listen, there's not nearly enough personal sacrifice being made. I, I mean, we don't, we, if, if a politician makes a personal sacrifice, we, we don't even know what to think about it. That's not how it should be. See, we're used to politicians who operate on designated authority, not moral authority. But do you see that 12 years before Nehemiah ever challenged the leaders to stop what they were doing and give back what didn't belong to them, 12 years earlier, he was already laying a foundation of alignment in his own life between what he said and what he did. And those small sacrifices he made for all those years gave him credibility in the people's eyes. Listen, I promise the same would be true for you. In whatever walk of life you're in, and I promise the same would be true for our next president, whoever he or she may be. And then one other little thing, I just, I've got to have you notice, verse 16. He says, I also devoted myself to working on the wall, and I refused to acquire any land. In other words, I refused to get rich. Okay, I refused to take advantage. And I required all my servants to spend time working on the wall. Again, this is huge. When Nehemiah showed up, here's what his campaign pledge was. We're going to build a wall. Now, it's kind of funny that that's part of, you know, <laughs> right? Our current political thing is we're going to build a wall. He said we're going to build a wall. That's what we're going to do. What are we going to do? We're going to build a wall. What's your vision for Israel, Nehemiah? Build a wall. What's the first thing you're going to do in your first 100 days in office? We're going to build a wall. Nehemiah said, so if you're looking for me and you want to know what I'm doing, I'm building the wall. If you want to know where my family, my officials, my staff, if you want to know what they're doing, we're building the wall. You want to find me? Don't go to my office. Come out to the wall. That's where I'm going to be. He said, we're going to focus on the very thing we promised to do. We're going to put all of our energy into the thing that is most important for the people of this nation. And then he went out and he personally was a part of doing it. Here's wise leadership principle number six. A wise leader has alignment between what he asks people to do and what he does himself. 
walk in. You, you want to know how Nehemiah was able to get to people to not only make a promise, but to keep a promise? It is very simple. He earned moral authority. He earned it with his promises. He earned it with his actions. He earned it with personal sacrifices. And quite honestly, he earned it by caring more about God and other people than he did about himself. That is how a wise leader does it. Dear Mr. or Mrs. President, give me, just give me a second. I get emotional. For the next four years, you will be reminded on a daily basis of whether or not the citizens of this country approve of your performance. Our hope is that you will set your sights on something of far greater consequence than our approval. We want you to lead us in such a way as to gain and maintain our respect. That's all we want. For that to happen, there must be consistency between what you say and what you do. This alignment will provide you with the moral authority necessary to lead and influence those who selected your name in November as well as those who did not. Right now our country is deeply divided over issues like the economy, health care, national security. A significant portion of the population will never share your beliefs about how these issues should be addressed. There is nothing you can do about that. But please, don't do anything that would lead us to wonder if you really believe what you have said you believe about those issues. Our hope is that you will be a president whose actions reflect the promises you've made and the values you claim to embody. And if that is the case, you will ultimately have something far more valuable than our approval. You will have our respect. Oakdale, I pray that we would not just point a finger, but we would understand this applies to us. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, just help us to recognize, God, this is not about a president. This is not about a country. This is not about a government. God, this is about us as individuals, as families, as a church, as a community. God, we've got to get this right because the biggest part of our ability to be a light for you, to influence others for you, has to do with our credibility. It has to do with whether or not we're going to be hypocrites. And we already, we're, we're, we're behind the eight ball, God. We already have a bad reputation. Fair or not fair. And people are already looking at us and expecting us to do one thing while we say something different. And that cannot be the case, God. So help us. Help us as individuals to apply what we see in the life of Nehemiah where we care more about you and other people than we do about ourselves. And that leads us to focus on the, the promises that we make to meet the needs of lost and hurting people. And may that result in us having alignment between what we say and what we do. And may that lead to us impacting our culture and may that lead to us impacting our government. God, help us because we cannot and we will not do this on our own. But I believe, Father, if as individuals we will commit to you and we will lean on you and we will surrender to you, you will help us be the light that we are called to be. Help us lean on you. In Jesus' name, amen.